when missionaries came and Westerners came, the Russians, the Americans, it was a very, very difficult time for our people. Our languages were being banned. Of course, our dances and ceremonies uh, were considered uh, evil and heathenistic and were uh, suppressed by the, the, the churches that came in. So our people felt like we woke up one day and just being tenants on our own land. I'm like, how did that happen? How did it happen so fast? It's mind blowing. And so my style, when I'm dancing, I'm like there to connect. I'm there to give people that joy and, and that feeling of like love and, and um, especially for the young people out there, our people just to give them that feeling of like being proud of who they are. The first drumming and singing chant, you know, song, traditional song I heard and experienced was in Bethel. So I went and sat down and I started hearing the drumming and the singing and I said, wow. And I sat back and I was like, whoa, this is beautiful. It felt familiar. Each dance is a story. For example, here is a kayak, and the women all do the movements with the men all together. So here it is. Here is a kayak, paddle it, paddle it. Up comes a seal, harpoon it, pull in the ropes, pick up the seal, place it on your kayak, and head home. Yoo-hoo! Happy hunter, because he's bringing home a seal. For me, what was really special was coming back to Akitan and teaching dance in Akitan because I grew up in Akitan without a dance group. It was when I was about four or five years old that I first saw the Atkhamtalagas Nikangas. They came to Akitan, they danced in our gym, and they taught us this dance, um, the seal dance, Esurich. And um, I just remember being this little four year old dancing around Akitan, doing the seal dance everywhere I could. And that moment sort of is really defining in my life because it was then that I knew that I wanted to dance. In these dances, um, and even in creating artwork for dance, or creating our regalia for dancing, we're respecting the animals that gave their lives for us too. So it's like constantly working in this reciprocal exchange of harvesting and giving back. There's a reason that we have had ceremony for so long, because it's a very, very powerful way to build relationships. I think that so many of those relationships in today's world, like with the herring and with other species, other beings have been broken as well as between indigenous people and non-indigenous people. And what I've seen happen through the herring protectors and through ceremony is that healing, a healing and coming together. Masks are universal to the human being. Every culture uses them in one form or another. It's fundamentally a tool of transformation. By wearing a mask, you can transform yourself uh, and you can change time. You can go back in time and you go forward in time, uh, all with the use of a mask. The face is the most universal identity factor of, of a human in interactive social being. So by changing that face, you really transform yourself. We use masks to transform and work between our worlds. We can become a messenger by virtue of becoming a bird. We can make a song that can travel between worlds. But when you put the mask on, you can become something other than yourself. And that's, that's the nature of the tool, that's the utility. The Kodiak masks, for instance, have a really heavy eyebrow. In Western culture, lighting is from the top down. Inside a kazikak, the fire is the light, and it's bottom up. 
And when you light our masks from the bottom up, they look entirely different. <laughs>